I should be speaking on the topic, people-centered policies for nation building. Over to you, Matt. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't know if you can, it's saying, I wanted to put on my video, so you have to give me permission to do so. Okay, great. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations on your efforts and uh, well done to the young people who are spending their precious Saturday morning engaging on this important topic. I am going to be giving a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so please bear with me as I try to find it. Um, okay, good. I think I found it. Can you see? Yes, we can. For some reason, it's in a different mode, but let me see if we can see it in a different mode. I'm going to stop sharing and try and see if I can get it in a different mode. Sorry for the delay. Okay. So let's go try again and see if we can get it. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Please confirm you can see it. Yes, we can. Very clearly. Fantastic. All right, so I, I modified the title because I really believe when we talk about policy, sometimes we get overwhelmed um, and even angry. So whenever I do have an opportunity to talk to young people, I say, how do you scale your impact in your communities and country? Um, and I'm starting off with a question to all our young people. What challenges confront us in our country and our continent? Can you just drop your ideas in the chat? What are some of the challenges we're currently facing? I know this has been a hackathon ideas fest, so you've been talking about ideas. But whenever you talk about uh, ideas, they come from problem solving. And when we have problems, they're challenges. And whenever we see challenges, we see opportunities. So just drop in the chat, what keeps you up at night? What are the things that you're really upset about? The things that are draining you, the challenges you have in your community, in your companies, in your country and in the continent. Um, so when I think about the challenges and our current situation, I think we could complain, right? Many of us could complain. Some of us are japaying, right? We're leaving, we're like, it's too much. Or we could choose to become change agents. And that's really about what you choose to do in your context. And when I think about policies that have come out of challenges, I hope you can see the page on policies. I look at some global examples that inspire me because I always like to look at other countries and what change agents have done in those countries that we can learn from. One policy, because I work in the food and agriculture sector that has really inspired me is Brazil's local sourcing policy. So Brazil has had a school feeding program for since the early uh, 1900s, maybe 1956, et cetera. But they then decided in the 90s to have what they called a local sourcing policy, which meant that basically if you were going to have money or get money to do school feeding in your community, you had to source at least 30% of what you were feeding the children from local farmers. This was life changing for the local farmers, but it was also life changing for the local communities because it meant that food wasn't being brought in. It meant that the farmers were growing the food for their children to go to school completely has made Brazil a food self-sufficient country and in fact a net exporter of food because they looked inwards, they pushed themselves to say we're not going to be importing food to feed our children, we're going to grow it. If you think about that in the context of Nigeria, we're net importers of food and we're importing food that we could grow locally. So early in my life as a change agent, I actually came up with a food, a local food sourcing policy saying every restaurant, every uh, supermarket in Nigeria every should have at least 60% of what is on their shelves from Nigeria. Of course, that was, has never seen the light of day, but that was an example of what inspired me because of the Brazil local sourcing policy. Rwanda also has a no plastic policy. And if you've ever been to Rwanda, you can't actually enter the country with plastics. In fact, they announced on the plane that if you have brought any plastics with you, leave them on the plane, that they'll seize them when you're entering the country. 
Rwanda early in its existence said, we're not going to have plastics. We're not going to have plastic bottled water. We're not going to have plastic containers for our biscuits, for our spices, everything. We're not going to have plastics. And from plastic bags onwards, and that's why Kigali is one of the cleanest cities in Africa because of this no plastic policy, but it's also forced innovation amongst the entrepreneurs. So you see them using paper um, and cardboard and other more uh, sustainable approaches to um, local sourcing and local packaging. Another one is the US Black Lives Movement and Black Lives Matter Movement. And some of you know about Black Lives Matter. It started after the George Floyd killing, but what did it foster? It fostered a DNI policy, diversity and inclusion, where now in some stores like Sephora, they said 20% of the products on their shelves have to be from black and brown communities. Supermarkets are saying 20% of the products on their shelves, at least 20 have to be from black and brown communities. This movement led to policies. Every school now has a diversity and inclusion officer. Every company now has a diversity and inclusion officer. Every company is being tracked on what diversity and inclusion matters and makes. Some people are window dressing, some people are greenwashing as we call it when it comes to sustainability, but at least it has forced people to question how many black people are in our senior management? How many black people are in our staff? How are they rising through the ranks? What about their products? Are they on shelves? How are we empowering them? And the last example is South Africa's Black Empowerment Program. Now, those who know the history of South Africa know that land and mines and, um, and farmlands were seized from black people. So BEE basically said, we're gonna readjust the wealth in this country. And we're gonna make sure that black people get back their wealth. And we're gonna give ownership to more black people. Now, some people say, oh, people weren't ready. They messed up. They got rich too quickly, whatever you think. The fact is that wealth had to be redistributed to those who really own the land. So these are examples from a global front. Now, when you look at local examples, there are not many that I could find that inspired me, but I'll mention a few. Sanusi Lamino Sanusi, when he was central bank governor, made a commitment to say, we need to have 30% of all bank boards to be women. At the time it was controversial. People said, we can't find women. Why should we give quotas for women? They're not qualified women. Today in Nigeria, unlike any other part of the world, at least six banks have female CEOs. Fidelity Bank has a female CEO. Uh, Citibank has a female CEO and we can go down the list. Unity Bank has a female CEO. This is exciting. And then we have female board chairs. Historically, women were out of the boardroom. Now, if you say that a country has 50% women, and why is it a big deal that 30% of board seats should have women? I joined my first corporate board, Cornerstone. I was the only woman. Cornerstone Insurance, now there are more women. Nigerian breweries, I was the second woman. Now we have almost 50% women. So it's really important that if we say we serve female customers, we have to have female representation because they have the ideas of their diversity. But Lamido Sanusi took out his own desire and made a policy out of it. We also have a universal basic education policy, which has insists that children have to be educated. Now, how many of them follow through in our cities, in our states? But yet, it's a good policy. I was a beneficiary of the Unity Schools, where at the time, the government created 102 Unity Schools to unite the nation after the Civil War. So in my secondary school, Federal Government College, Enugu, we had people from the North, the South, the East, the West. And at the time it made sense. Unity schools do not make any sense today just because the funding is being misappropriated and the quality has dropped. But at the time they were the best schools in Nigeria. You had to apply for them, you had to compete for them and they attracted the best students from all over the country. And we formed a bond that where we didn't see ourselves as Igbo Yoruba Alsa, we saw ourselves as FGCE. And that alumni network is still very powerful, but we don't have many local examples. So now to you, when we think about the problems, and I hope people wrote down the problems they find that they think about, I always tell young people, when you think about a problem, how can you make a solution out of it? And how can that solution become policy? And I'm going to give you a few examples in our context from my own life and my own experience. But the first step for you is to say, what is my life's purpose? What makes me angry? What gives me joy? What gives me energy? And what am I willing to do for free? Finding your life's purpose is so critical to you becoming a policymaker and influencing policy for good. And many young people don't know their life's purpose. And I would argue that you have to do some due diligence today. Go back home, ask two people in your life, 
to some questions, ask them, what am I good at? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? When was a time I inspired you? When it was a time I disappointed you? And what do you think I'll achieve in life and why? Because when we think about our continent and our country, we're faced with fear, surprise, sadness, disgust, anger, anticipation, some joy, some trust. And we are confronted with a single story. And this is what propelled my work in food and agriculture and my work to shape policy in food and agriculture. This single story, I moved to the US at 16 and this was a single story that I got confronted with. At the face of Africa was a hungry child. People used to tell me, oh, Ndidi, where are you from? I'll say Nigeria. Oh, my mom used to say, finish your dinner. There are hungry children in, in Biafra. Or finish your dinner, there are hungry children in Somalia, Swazi, uh, uh, South Sudan. And the face of poverty being a female farmer from Africa. This made me angry because I know the potential of our continent. I know the size of our continent, that you can put the United States, China, Eastern Europe, India, France, Germany, and Spain into the continent of Africa, and you have, still have space left over. I know that we have great people and untapped potential, and that the world depends on us for so much. Even with what's going on in Niger, at the moment, we know that Niger is one of the largest producers of some of our precious metals. We will never let Congo rest or the Democratic Republic of Congo because they're the largest producer of some of our uh, minerals. And without Congo, you can't have a cell phone or a computer. So when we think about how we're naturally endowed for excellence, in my book, it's agricultural excellence and others. It's lots of other things, human potential, the natural um, minerals, the gold, the, the, the platinum, the coal, the iron, the diamonds, etc. So first you have to say, what makes you angry? In my case, it was the, the face of Africa being a hungry child. Yours might be different, right? And then once you've figured out, you have to embrace some critical values, your hunger. And when I say hunger, it's not hunger for food, it's hunger for change, right? Humility, emotional intelligence, accountability. You have to be visionary and agile and you have to have integrity and empathy. Now having a vision means what will need to change and how will I change it? What do I need to disrupt? What do I need to redesign? I established Leap Africa in 2002 because I was angry that I was being told as a 28 year old that I was a leader of tomorrow. And I said, what does tomorrow hold in a country where the life expectancy is 57? Some of you are 25, some of you are 22, some of you are 20, and you're still being told you're a leader of tomorrow when you should be leading today and tomorrow. So LEAP was born out of the desire to change the way we viewed ourselves from being leaders of tomorrow to saying, now we have skills, we have time, we're willing to take risks, we're creative. Let's start an organization that can change the status quo. And it's interesting when we think about it, we started with a youth leadership program for 18 to 35 year olds. Now we move to a program for secondary school students. So now across eight countries in Africa, we teach teachers to deliver a curriculum on leadership ethics and civics. And we measure the impact of LEAP based on the change projects that young people start in the communities and how they shape policy. In my own case, beyond LEAP, I started, and I'm no longer on the board of LEAP, I've stepped down, I started working in food and agriculture, understanding the critical realities and the promising trends, understanding that we had poor policies, high rates of malnutrition, high rates of post-harvest losses, climate change affecting us, but yet there were promising trends with digitization, with technology, with youth engagement, I also started a co-founded a food company called Ace Foods with my husband and trying to change the way that we grow food and source food and process food for the local and international markets and then started Sahel Consulting. And Sahel Consulting works heavily in policy, really focused on changing the way that agriculture is done across Africa and ensuring that we have food for our people. And I just want to focus on one policy initiative that we've been very involved in at Sahel. So, Nigeria is one of the largest importers of milk, dried milk from all over Europe and even New Zealand. And yet we have the fourth largest cattle herd in Africa. I don't know how many of you know that. But our nomadic communities, they travel around the country. So their cows are very lean and they don't produce enough milk. So we have a very unproductive milk sector. And so through Aldine, Advancing Local Dairy Development in Nigeria, we basically have found private sector partners that are ready to source milk locally and with support from the Gates Foundation, we're shaping the policy on dairy in Nigeria. So we got the Ministry of Agriculture, the Central Bank, the Ministry of Trade and Investment, the Ministry of Finance, 
Ministry of Women Affairs to come together to create a policy, a national dairy policy. And that is so important because for a country to move forward, you need a seamless policy because every single agency had its own mandate. Agriculture the Ministry wants to improve the productivity of cows. Ministry of Trade and Investment wants to maximize tariffs and quotas. So they're okay with milk imports coming in, but they want to get more quotas from them. Central Bank is giving Forex, preferential Forex for milk importers. You see how those are conflicting with each other. So we had to bring everybody in a room and come up with a national policy on dairy. There was a lot of fighting, a lot of controversy because multinationals have a different interest from local providers. Who are the multinationals who are big in milk? Friesland Campina is huge. It's a 70% market share. You have Arla, that's Danone. Dano, sorry, you have all these players and they, they want to bring more milk in because they're owned by farmers in their countries. We want to reduce the milk imports and support our farmers so you can understand the conflict. And this has taken a long time. We also had to strengthen the National Dairy Ranchers Association so that beyond Sahel's work, there are groups of policymakers that are supporting, that are groups of private sector players that are pushing for policy and are tracking milk imports into the country. And then we started the national conference, which is on World Milk Day every year. So that all stakeholders come together and say, what is changing? So it's not enough to shape policy. You need to build the systems, the structures, the infrastructure to make sure that it's sustained. Beyond shaping, having a vision, you have to be innovative and you have to be agile because to have a policy that works for people, it can be set, it cannot be stagnant. It has to be better. It has to make sure that initiatives are faster and more, uh, more beneficial for the average person. And that's why I started the next initiative, Changing Narratives Africa. And some of you might know about our work with Changing Narratives Africa. And why did I get upset about this? I'm using my own example so that you can understand how you can also channel it. The first thing I realized was that Africans in Africa barely register on US television. When they do, Africa the depiction of Africa broadly negative and Africa is viewed as a country. So we started an organization to change narratives about Africa. We had sessions, online sessions. We started a cohort to get our food on global shelves. And then we started telling stories. And then that led to the creation of a nonprofit called African Food Change Makers. An African food change maker's mission is to enable African entrepreneurs to start and scale resilient and sustainable agribusinesses that feed Africa and the world by providing training, funding, opportunities, exposure, trade linkages, and fostering a vibrant community of change makers. And what is our vision? A million successful and sustainable African agribusinesses that are transforming the food ecosystem and are recognized and respected across the globe. So this is my latest venture. It's three years old and it's been my toughest because many people benefit from how Africa is portrayed. Many people. Many people benefit from the single story that we're poor and hungry. So how do you change that? So we've started a range of programs, e-learning, and I hope you'll visit afchub.org. It's a free portal where you get funding, data, access to markets. But we started three programs this year, one on building resilience against climate and environmental shocks to teach our agripreneurs how to withstand shocks right and how to build sustainable businesses we start another one leading women african women in food fellowship to help women amplify their voices the scaling export program is really focused on getting our products on global sh shelves and our changing global narratives initiative which is focused on telling positive stories about africa we've done a podcast on one is called the jello fours what's all the hype about telling about the history of jello fries how we share this history why jollof is making the waves. And our dream is that jollof will become more popular than sushi globally, right? We've created a podcast on teff, on okra, on Afri uh, chocolates, on rooibos, and we're showcasing stories because our food has changed the world, but most people don't know that. And our influence has been so amazing. Imagine that okra is an Igbo word. The average Nigerian doesn't know that. The world has adopted a word from our culture as the global name for this vegetable. And that's why seafood okra from New Orleans called gombo is almost identical to seafood okra from Eastern Nigeria. And the world has to know this, right? That this word okoro was first written in the colony of Virginia in 1679 as an Igbo word. And if you look it up, you'll see that it's actually in the dictionary as an Igbo word. 
people love coffee, but they don't know it was born in Africa and that 18 countries in Africa produce some of the best, world's best coffee. They love chocolates, but they don't know two of countries in Africa, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, produce 70% of the world's chocolate. What about Coca-Cola? They love Coca-Cola, but they don't know that the word Coca-Cola was born out of cola nuts from West Africa and that the original recipe had cola nuts from West Africa. And if you go to the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta, you'll see that history. So I'm not making it up. So beyond having a vision and having a passion and being innovative, you have to have integrity. Nobody can shape policy or shape a future without integrity. Accountability, transparency, and thinking about the short-term, medium-term, and long-term consequences of that policy. Because some policies seem good in the long-term or in the short-term, but hurt us. So I'll give you an example from our recent history in Nigeria. We're currently dealing with the removal of fuel subsidies. That is a policy that has been enacted. In the short term, it's really painful, really, really painful, right? In the medium to long term, if the money that is saved from the removal of self-subsidies is utilized effectively, it will be a great policy. Now, it is up to us to hold governments accountable to ensure that that money is reallocated to healthcare and education and infrastructure and improving the lives of people, right? Oftentimes, we don't have integrity with policies and we don't think about the medium, short, and long-term implications of the policies we have. I believe that excellence and integrity have no hiding place. And as change agents, we have to have all. And we have to commit to lifelong learning. And we have to learn from the examples that have worked and those who have failed. As part of my commitment to changing voices, I also have gotten involved in curating events where we can change voices. And last year at Goalkeepers, I curated an event with the Goalkeepers team to get Bill Gates to make Fonio on a global stage. Fonio is acha in Nigeria. It's a highly nutritious uh, grain grown by mostly women in West Africa. And by having someone like Bill Gates cook this Fonio, it was amazing to see. Um, and those who haven't watched it, please look on YouTube. So I'm ending with a sense of urgency. Now, when you look at the needs in our country and the need for good policies, our population trends are worrisome. And this is for Africa. 1980, Africa had 477 million people. By 2016, we're 1.2 billion. By 2050, we'll be 2.4 billion. Nigeria is estimated to have, be, go, have 450 million people by 2050. Lagos is estimated to have 50 million people. Now, if you're a social innovator, someone who cares about people, you're worried. Where are these people going to sleep? What are they going to eat? In a city that's already below sea level, how are we going to deal with the floods? What about water? What about healthcare? What about sanitation? That keeps me up at night. But for every problem, there is a solution. So the question is, what are we going to do? We're going to find ways to change the status quo. We're going to invent and create policies that are going to improve the lives of others. I've written a few books to try to get us to think about this. One is called Social Innovation in Africa, or the local name is called Reaching Millions with Impact. And it says you have to have a clear mission, value, structure, pathways, business models, but you have to have a vision for what that change looks like. Nelson Mandela has a quote which says, vision without action is just a dream. Action without vision just passes in time. And vision with action can change the world. And that's why policies are critical. But you have to infuse scale into the DNA of your interventions. And you have to ensure that you leverage data and innovation. You shape the ecosystem, which is a policy piece, but it's just one piece of the puzzle. Because you have to measure the impact. You have to ensure that that intervention is implemented. We have great policies on the books that have never been implemented. That messaging and engagement has to be simple with compelling branding. And any policy or intervention has to be demand driven with measurable value addition and have agility, adaptation to risks and shocks embedded in it. We have to have the right talent to implement the policy, the right communications to actually get the policy into the engagement. We have to have the financing to ensure that the policy is implemented and we have to shape the ecosystem with their right enablers, the beneficiaries, the opponents, and the change makers. And we have to measure our impact and ensure that we shift funding flows to those who need it the most. We need to engage the private sector. Public sector role is just about creating an enabling environment for private sector and civil society to thrive. And we need to ensure that we engage the private sector. We need to engage women and youth with every policy, ensuring that they are visible and critical players, and ensuring that we have equity, 
in every policy with a gender lens and a youth lens with every policy we initiate. And we have to be prepared to partner with others as we implement. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. I've modified it to say, if you want to go fast and far, leave your egos and logos at the door and work with humility, integrity, and excellence, focusing on a shared vision and shared goals. So what are some critical advice for the journey as I round up? We need policies in this environment. We need policies in education, in healthcare. We need policies in agriculture. We need policies in governance and transparency and elections. We need election reform, right? We need youth policies that enable young people to have a voice. Not too young to run was a great idea, right? A great policy dimension, but how has it filtered in? When we look at the list of ministerial nominees, how many of them are under 40, right? If we look at the list of gov governors, how many of them are under 40? We need to reform the way elections are done in this country. We need to ensure that we figure out, and everyone on this call has to figure out which one makes them most angry and what are they going to do about it. I've chosen food and agriculture and I'm shaping policy globally and locally around this, right? What is your life's purpose and how are you going to pursue it diligently and leave your mark? You need to bring your A game every time. You need to commit to building a culture of equity, innovation and excellence. And you need to invest in building a community of support. Every young person who wants to shape policy, who wants to improve the lots for Nigerians, needs to have a sponsor, needs to have a champion, and needs to have a critic to hold them accountable. And as you rise, as you make impact, stay grounded and humble. Because we see so many people who get into the landscape and lose and forget why they got there, right? Either because they've joined government and they forget why they got there in the first place and they start drinking the Kool-Aid and we say, what happened? They changed or they get in and they become so pompous you can't reach them. So as you rise, as you become a policy maker, as you influence policy from inside or outside, and I've done it from outside more than inside. I served in government for like four months when Obia Zekwasili was there, but I've influenced policy more from outside. As you do it, Stay grounded as you rise. Some of us will go in. Some of the, us will stay outside. You determine which ones works for you as to influence policy. But as you rise, stay humble and grounded. And I'll end with two quotes that really inspire me. The first one is from a young African speaking to a president. And he said, this generation is no longer asking God to grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. We're asking the almighty to grant us the courage and wisdom to change the things we cannot accept. I cannot accept that 70, over 70% 70 of Nigerians live on less than a dollar a day. I cannot accept that. I cannot accept that the life expectancy in my country is less than 57 years old. I cannot accept that, right? I will not accept it. I can't accept that it's going to take 150 years for women to reach gender parity in Africa. There are things I cannot accept. That a, an, a child born in Nigeria is likely to die before their fifth birthday. So instead of asking God, or saying, I'm just going to accept it. No, I'm going to ask God to grant me the courage and wisdom to change the things I cannot accept. And another one, which really was my mantra during the COVID era, is Mbelede Kaja Madike. It's an Igbo uh, proverb, which is disasters help to sift out the resilience, the resourceful and brave. We are resilient, we are resourceful, and we are brave. And this is the time for us to rise into our calling as change agents in this country. We need to move from survival mode to a mode where we're thriving as young change agents, to a mode where we're leaving a legacy of impact for future generations. And it's really a challenge for us to move from survival to where we're thriving, to where we're leaving a legacy. And finally, if I tell you my dream, you might forget it. If I act on my dream, perhaps you remember it, but if I involve you, it becomes your dream too. The reason why I chose to spend my morning with you is because I want to involve you in my dream that we, can change the future of Nigeria, not just for us, but for future generations. So that when you think of Africa and when people think of Africa, they don't think of a hungry child or a poor female farmer. They think of these young, amazing children who have a bright future because they're well-nourished, because they have good food, good education. They live in a secure and safe environment and they can achieve their highest potential because of the work that you and I have done. So let's become change agents. Let's shape policy. Let's partner with each other and let's change the status quo. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you, thank you so much, Ma. I mean, you guys just, your emojis, your comments in the chats, let's show appreciation to, to Madam Muneli for such a wonderful session.
I'm sure most of us have gotten so many ideas for our policy briefs. <laughs> I could see people writing down as she was speaking. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Because of her time, we would quickly just go into the question um, and, access, and answer um, section just very quickly. So if you have any questions for, for her, please feel free to in indicate. I, I, I mean, either as a question on policy implementation generally, or a question particularly to the agriculture and food security track, because Ma, we, we have a, a particular track in the hackathon called agriculture and food security, and I'm sure they must have gotten so many tips from just the, the, the work you've done. So if you have a question directed to that particular track, feel free to also uh, signify. I think my, the, the question I have personally is, how are you able to keep everything rolling? Like, I, I feel like I, I lost count of how many initiatives and organizations that you are you founded and you're running and you're doing so many things. How are you able to keep everything going, you know, in a way that you're able to balance your, your time and ensure that you're, you're making impacts in several fields? Because I think that usually becomes a, a challenge for us young, young people. Yeah, so I, a great question. I always tell young people, you can have it all, but not all at the same time, right? You can have it all, but not all at the same time. The initiatives I've started, I didn't build them all at the same time, right? right. I built them sequentially. And for some of them now, I'm not involved at all, right? So Leap Africa have dropped off the board um, and I'm not involved, right? I started it when I was 28. And now young people are running the organization and I'm not involved. So for us, you have to in figure out what you makes you angry right now and what you can spend your time doing. And don't be worried about the money. The money will come. A lot of people think that I was making a lot of mistakes by starting leaving the private sector and going into the nonprofit sector. And now they say you're so strategic. They told me I was making a lot of mistakes by leaving... Um, leaving, you know, entering the agriculture sector, right? In fact, somebody in who's related to us said two Harvard graduates becoming, you know, pepper, pepper grinders when we started Ace Foods. And now they're like, oh, you are so strategic. How did you know agriculture was the next goal? You know, so you can't follow anybody else. You have to listen to what God is telling you to do at every point in time and really focus on what are my unique callings what makes me angry and what can I do about it? And then surround yourself with mission-driven high achievers, right? It's really important to surround yourself with people who will help you achieve your highest potential and deliver with excellence. And then God continues to prosper you. So Ace Foods is run by a young dynamic team. Sahel Consulting is run by, but when I started them, I worked on them for many years, right? Now I serve them as advisor, engaging, supporting, reviewing, connecting but I don't work with these organizations day to day. So that's my answer. You can't do it all at the same time. I'm a mother, I'm a wife. <laughs> I sometimes drop balls, many, many balls, right? But that's just the situation you find yourself. So you have to keep on pushing. Don't give up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And she's also shared links to the various organizations. So just in case you guys want to check it out, feel free to check it out. Th thank God your hand was up. Um, if you few minutes ago, do you, do you still have your question or has it been answered? And I okay. encourage everybody who's in the agriculture track to please join African Food Chain. Is it is it just me? Can you guys hear me? Just to be sure that I can hear you. I think it's our network. No, I think our network has gone off. I think it's a connection. Okay. All right. All right. Okay, let me just give it a few. The few network hours. is not is not uh, stable. It's shaking. Yeah, it is. Hello, man. Are you back? It feels like the network took you out for a few for a few seconds. to it and work, work diligently 
to make sure that they deliver excellence. So don't be dismayed if you are in the food and agriculture or have friends who are in it, please tell them to join African Food Change Makers. We're taking some people to Egypt this year. We've already taken some people to other countries. We're helping them grow their influence and impact. Um, some are going to be going to other places with us this year, including um, Tanzania. Um, so trust me when we say it's not just, there's enough support, enough funding, but we need to find those who have integrity and excellence and who have a work ethic that is unmatched. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank Thanks you a lot. so much. Great well, connecting well, with all of you. I wish definitely. you the very best. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Thanks a lot. We're we going to mute and just say thank you to, to Madam Munelli for such thank a wonderful Thank you so much, Ma. God bless you. Thank you, Ma. Thank, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much, Ma. Thank you, Ma'am. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much, um, everyone. It's a pleasure having you, man. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, guys. Thanks for um wonderful participation. Um, so just, just before we go, do does anyone have any questions? I, I know we had that earlier. I can see that there are some questions around the link, and that has been shared um as well in the in the chat. So for, for those people who are under the agriculture. And food security track. It's like this hackathon is for so you guys, right? Because you guys are you guys are getting a, a whole lot of information. But yeah, we have other speakers that would also be of you know benefits to people from so many other tracks as well. So let's 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 do well to be ready for for that. Um, the next session will be at three p.m. Can we have a slide? Yes, we'll reach out to her and, and get that and share as well. Yeah, to look, you guys have gotten so many so much expo. Like you guys, your your policy brief needs, needs to be flying. <laughs> yeah okay Priscilla you have a question yes I do good morning okay. everyone can can you hear me yes yes loud and clear okay. my question is for Mrs Indidi I want to ask if um so she has so she has left she, she has oh, she left, left but I oh. think what what you can do is maybe if you if you write out your question um we can send an email to her and then copy you and then see how to, okay. to get her to respond to that okay. yes I'll yes, do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so great to do that and, and share with us. Okay, so if we have no more questions or comments, thanks everyone. Um, we can go back to our teams and continue our, our work. Um, wishing you guys all of the best as you continue to hack and write your policy idea. Don't forget okay. that registration for teams. Um, Comfort, do you want to say something? Okay. Yeah, please. Um, sorry, good morning, everyone. Okay. So a lot of people have reached out to me this morning to say their team members are not responding. Please, time wait for nobody. Just go ahead and drop that. Um, I mean, you're looking to join a team, mention your track so that you're able to, you know, jump on the train because time waits for nobody. Thank you. Amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, if your team members are not are not responding, I put, put a, a comment in the in the chats, in the WhatsApp group and ask for new new team team members. Yeah. I mean, we understand that some of, sometimes these things are definitely going to happen, but you might find someone from other track from a, a similar track who might be willing to work work with you. So please do that quickly so that um register because registration for teams closes at 12. Um yeah, I mean if, if we see that there's still like a lot of time for people to register, we might extend it by 30 minutes or so. But let's let's work towards 12 o'clock to be able to register our teams so that we can focus on because we, we definitely need to find ways to get the budget over to you. And if we don't close registration, we won't be able to do that. Abdul Razak, your hand is up. Yes, my hand is up. Okay, go on, go on. Uh, uh thank you very much for uh, a wonderful session and uh of course bringing us together for uh, this very important uh, learning opportunity. Uh, uh, if you could recall yesterday, I was the one that uh, was asking question I joined very lately and I missed out uh, uh, virtually everything that was discussed. I, I got missed out. Yeah. And did you, uh, yes. Did you, get the, did you get the recording? Because we shared it last night, the recording to the, to the session. We shared it on the WhatsApp okay. group and also via email. As okay, well. okay, this morning? Yeah. Last night, last night. Say, I mean, well, early, early this morning, say at about 1 a.m. Yeah, I think I didn't get that. Uh, and I'm even, I don't think I'm even part of the WhatsApp group. Okay. Can, let me, just, just give me a sec quickly. I think we can stop recording now. Yes, uh, I sent an 